Good morning. I'd like to give a shout out to the absolute best mother I know, and that is my wife, Meredith. Meredith, your children absolutely honor you, respect you, love you. They uh, recognize how much you have poured into them, and uh, it has not been in vain. And as far as their, or your grandchildren go, uh, I believe with all how many is it now? Five of them. They all rank you amongst their top friend. So good job. I love you, honey. And um, just had to say that before I start here. Well, we know that uh, the coronavirus is uh, causing all kinds of havoc. Uh, it, it's as though right now the ground we're standing on, it is shaking. It's, there's no stability. And I, I was, as I was reflecting, a lot of this is because there's no promises coming out right now from anybody. There's no date as to when, um, for example, uh, small businesses, restaurants will be open. There's no uh, positive news as to when schools will be open. There is no positive news as to when the state and small businesses um, are going to be open. There's no promises being made. There's no promise when church can be open. Uh, and I know a lot of uh, small business owners right now, you're living right on the edge. These are trying times, not only because of the virus, but primarily the impact the virus is having on all of us. And the issue is, without there being promises made to uh, the general public or to you individually, uh, there is no hope. And that's what we're all feeling. We're feeling the effects of that. And so I'm going to back up the bus and go from hope to the promise, and today we're going to dig deep into unshakable promises. Uh, we're going to look at some unshakable promises of God. Now, this is uh, the fourth part in our series, and uh, we've talked, we started out talking about God's unshakable protection. Remember the, the three young uh, boys in the fire? We uh, talked about Elisha the next week, about God's presence, the chariots of fire, we talked last week about God's providence uh, and how he worked in Joseph's life. And today we're talking about promises. And we're going to look into uh, the life of Ruth. But before I go there, I, I really want us to think, about, um, to think about promises. I'm not sure we, uh, well, if you're like me, I, I don't take a whole lot of time and ever dwell on even the concept of promise. And I want to I get us to that point before I talk about Ruth and even some of God's promises. But I first want to share with you what uh, promises can do. And there's, uh, of course, they can do a lot of things. These are four things that came to the top of my mind. One is promises leave a favorable impression. Um, they absolutely do. They address a desire or a need that you have. And uh, when you hear that promise, it, it, it just gives you a warm feeling. This is before the promise is even uh, made, but even a promise given does that for us. That's why it's such an effective tool of politicians, um, and I don't want to stereotype too much, but of salesmen, and even parents make these promises, and it just seems to bring a certain amount of calm. And in our innocence, when we hear those promises, they draw us to like the one who's making the promise. But they also do this. They create a certain vulnerability because now when a promise is spoken, uh, a promise is expected. But let me give you a second thing what promises can do is promises may conceal dishonest intentions. Why? Because maybe there is tremendous pressure that is being felt, and a promise can temporarily relieve some of that pressure. Or perhaps a person is in trouble, and a promise made can push uh, the trouble down the road a little bit. Um, but not all promises made are, are honest. They can be dishonest. Uh, I think about that in my own life, where I've had people who have borrowed money, um, and I'm not just talking $5, $10, but I mean hundreds of dollars, in one case over a thousand dollars, and uh, people very desperate, no, I promise I'll get you, I'll pay you back, and uh, you know, I'll never see that money again, dishonest. Uh, I think about this, I thought about this story, there was a time before I moved into ministry when I worked in uh, a company called Manning Environmental, and Manning Environmental was in the um, Harvey West Industrial Park, we called it that, some industry, uh, industrial park, but the, the company was at 120 Dubois Street, 
And we had it, we were a small company, maybe 70 people, and we had an opening for a customer service technician. And one day, a guy shows up with a polished resume, looked great. His name was Bo Dubois. Bo Dubois wanting to work for us on Dubois Street. And uh, he impressed everybody. He had, a, he had a charming southern accent. When we hired him, he wasted no time at all in getting to meet all 70 of us who worked in the company. And what he did is he began making promises based on some of our interests uh, that we had. Uh, if you had an interest in, say, classic cars, he had one he was going to sell you at dirt cheap price, fully restored. If you had an interest in boating, uh, he had a boat that he was going to let you borrow and use. Uh, he promised me and Meredith that uh, he had a houseboat up in Sacramento that he was going to let us go up there for a week and have a vacation. And it was like, fantastic. Uh, he, he had uh, extra motorcycles. He was looking to give one away. All these promises. And I remember the chatter in the company was all like, man, isn't Bo a great guy? A month later, he never shows up for work, and he embezzled tens of thousands of dollars from that company. Um, and it taught me something about, uh, about promises, is that promises... Um, are very cheap. <laughs> they are very cheap. Uh, one of the promises that I think has harmed a lot of people is those, if you've ever found yourself in a, in a uh, codependent relationship where you've experienced, you've been on the abuse receiving end, the abuse happens, the uh, perpetrator uh, is remorseful, confesses, promises, I'll never do that again, I'm sorry, just let me back in, I, I'll never do that, I'll change my ways, and for a while there's the calm, and then it comes again. And the same cycle, and the cycle goes again and again and again. And um, it's just, it breaks my heart, because as a pastor I hear of these things. But when I think about the darker side of promises, um, I get a little bit skeptical. Perhaps you do too. Now, here's the third thing what promises can do is promises unkept. And that's where we get in a problem when you have a promise maker but not a promise keeper. They may cause unrecoverable disappointment. Um, they may cause unrecoverable, that there's a pain, a wound, a scar that, uh, that gets embedded that won't heal. I did a little Google search, and I, I simply put in, what are um, the most unkept promises? Uh, it was something to that effect. And by far, the number one unkept promise um, was revealed, and it was this. And I know this may hit home, close to home for some people. I promise to have and to hold from this day forward, for better uh, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and to cherish till death do us part. And I know that's a promise two people make to each other, and that promise is valid as long as both people keep that up. And unfortunately, a lot of times, one person loses interest and said, I'm done. Um, and think about the disappointment that comes with that. Now, is there redemption? Sure, there can be redemption. But as far as that relationship goes, the disappointment is unrecoverable. By the way, I want to let you know that I make promises and I break promises. You make promises and you break promises too. And the problem with this is that they erode trust. Um, even in little things like, hey, I'll be there in five minutes. You ever say that? Or, hey, I'm busy. I'll call you later. Give me an hour. <laughs> Or, hey, we'll keep, in tr we'll keep in touch for sure. Or, you know, let me think about that. I'll get back to you. Or how about this one? You ever hear this one? Well, we can still be friends. <laughs> there is just disappointment. That's the dark side of these. But uh, the result of this, the result with promises that aren't kept, is a lot of times we then put all promises in the same bucket that we just don't, value them all that much. We just don't. And that's where I want to reverse that a little bit or that thinking today. See, because what promises can do, promises made by a, by a promise keeper bring hope. And I want you to know God is a promise maker and God is a promise keeper. He has an absolutely perfect track record. He has never made a promise that he has not kept. And that is what sets him apart from all others. I remember being in seminary and we had to 
do uh, uh, talk about God, like who is God, what is God. I, I believe it's what is God, and, and I believe the consensus, and we had to be as concise as, as we could. And I remember one of the answers was this, God is like no other. God is like, no, there's nothing you can compare God to, especially when it comes to his track record of making and keeping promises. Um, his promises are reliable. His promises are comforting. His promises are life-changing. And let me tell you why they are so powerful and why it is that he can keep them, because a promise requires really four things. Perhaps more. This isn't intended to be an exhaustive list, but it requires at least these things. One, pure intentions absolutely pure intentions, no malice, they're not self-serving, they're genuine, and they're for your good. Think about Jeremiah 29, 11, where the Lord said, for, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you a hope and a future. Uh, that's the pure intention of God that he pours out to you and to me. Second thing is a promise requires clear communication. It's got to be crystal clear so that the promise cannot be twisted or misunderstood or misinterpreted. And that's where we have the word of God, where his promises come to us through his word. That is the reliable source of his promises. They don't come through fleeces necessarily or, or, or dreams or visions. They can but the, the reliable communication comes from the Word of God. And remember, I, man, remember the day when people would make promises to each other and it would be on a handshake? It'd be on a handshake. Uh, those days are gone because of how cheap promises have become. And now, and now when you talk about things, the response is always, make sure you get that in writing. Make sure you get that in writing. And, uh, and even that uh, reveals a little bit about societally how we feel about promises. Number four, it takes unrestricted ability. And by that, I mean unrestricted ability to make the promise happen. It's not a if, then, or if, when. Uh, that is called a conditional promise. God makes promises. <laughs> God makes promises. Um, a conditional promise sometimes is, well, if you get that A in that subject, then you will get this. And really, they, they turn into more of a reward. God promises things just out of the goodness and the grace of his heart. And then I'd say the fourth thing is it takes focused resolve. It takes um, someone that just says, I will not dismiss this. I will not forget this. I will pursue this. This will not be dropped and they stake their name and their reputation, their very life on it as well. So with all that said, I want to take you to perhaps what I, when the word promise, biblical promise, uh, I want to take you to one made between two women in the Bible. It's in Ruth. And um, this promise always just grips me. And I think if this is a, a commitment of a promise that one human can make to another, uh, I think that's recorded in here to give us just a glimpse of the veracity of the promise that God makes to us. This is found in the, the book of Ruth. I'm not going to go through the whole story. I, you, I recommend you read Ruth chapter 1. Uh, you could do that sometime today. But let me just set up the story here. There was a, a husband and wife, Elimelech and Naomi. They lived in Bethlehem. They had two teenage sons. And a famine came to the land, and they had no food. So they left their land, went about 50 miles east, and went to Moab, where there was an abundance of food. So as they went into that land, these two teenage boys, they grew up, and they both married Moabite women. And for the time, uh, Naomi's life was going well, but then tragedy struck. Elimelech died. And then her two sons died. And then a famine occurred in Moab. And so here was Ruth. She had no husband. She had no sons, no land, no food, no security, no future. And so what she decides to do is to return to the land of Judah, to return to Bethlehem, to return to her people. And then she urge, or, uh, urges rather, her two daughter-in-laws to stay behind, Orpah and Ruth. 
hey, stay behind. This is your land. These are your people. You can have a future here. You can remarry somebody. And in Jewish law, uh, if your husband died, it was the responsibility of a brother to now wed you. And Ruth just says, I'm too old. Even if I had another husband today and had a baby, would you wait for that son to grow up to marry him? No, stay here. It's more bitter for me than for you. And in the midst of this, Orpah, who you cannot blame, says, you're right, I'll stay here. Ruth said, no way. Listen to the promise she made. This is Ruth chapter 1, verse 16. But Ruth replied, don't urge me to leave you. Or to turn back from you. Where you go, I will go. And where you stay, I will stay. Your people will be my people and your God, my God. Wow. Where you die, I will die and there I will be buried. May the Lord deal with me, be it it ever so severely, if even death separates you and me. She made that promise You can read all the way to the end of Ruth. She kept that promise. And I believe that's one of the big reasons why that story is even in the Bible, including God's plan of redemption. See, in the life of Ruth um, and Naomi, because Naomi suffered as well, you cannot control what happens in life. It it can't be done. The only thing you control, control is how you respond to it. And Naomi just was ready to give up, and Ruth said, okay, I agree. I've lost my father-in-law. I've lost my husband. I lost my brother-in-law. I have no food either. But she responded in a way that exercised her faith and gave hope in the future. And that's what faith is all about. It's about daring to believe that God is working everything for your good, even when you don't feel like it or see it happening. And that's uh, a snapshot of what's going on right now with COVID-19, isn't it? We're all feeling this. What's going to happen? There's so much uncertainty. I mean, I'm, I'm of that age now where I actually think about, hmm, how am I going to live when I stop getting a paycheck? I think about retirement. <laughs> and then I open up my retirement account, and it seems like every day it's going lower. What's up? I mean, I think about just being stuck inside. You know, right now, if you own a boat in Santa Cruz County, unless it's already in the harbor, you can't even launch it. When are they going to open up the launch ramp? I don't know. We're stuck inside. My wife lost her job. We hope she gets it back. She's begun. They've opened up a door for her. But will it be to that same level? Will that be there when the school reopens, if it reopens next year? We had to change vacation plans and and that's, that's just what's happening to us. But for you, I know some of you are right at that point where financially you're getting hammered. You've lost your job. You don't know how you're going to pay next month's rent. You're going to have to leave the state. You're looking at how are you going to keep your business alive. You've got employees that you care about that, they, that you're no longer able to provide for them. We can't control that, but all we can control is our response. And knowing God, knowing who God is, makes all the difference in how I respond and how you respond. And, I, and when it comes to promises, we must think about the things that God's promised and the things he's never promised. Some think that, well, since I've received God, he promised that my life is going to be absolutely great. God never promised that. He, or or in the way we, would, we may want to interpret that and write that out. It's fulfilling, it's meaningful, it's got purpose, yes. But Jesus said this in John 16, in this world you will have trouble. In this world you'll have trouble. He said it. And so I realize life many times is not easy. Life is very difficult. Life sometimes is not fair, and when it's not fair or when it's not easy, I don't go back to God and say, God, why? I say, God, you told me it would be like this. You told me it'd be like this. And I was just thinking about some things in my own life, and and honestly, I've had a pretty good life, but five different times I've been carted into the ER with a uh, life-threatening situation. I've gone through nine different surgeries. 
I've been in auto accidents where I have totaled the vehicles. Um, I've lost investments in, um, in some very large amounts. I've had relationships that have just gone away. They've disappeared. Uh, ones that at one time were so dear to me, and now they're gone. Um, life's not easy. Life's not fair. There's more promises here. Jesus said this in Matthew 24, verse 12. He said, because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. And I know this. I know that uh, people cannot be dependent on. People will let you down. Why? Because they're not so much concerned about you as they are about themselves. They're not interested in you, and that's what love does. Love always uh, works for the interest, the greater interest of the other person. But because of how wickedness continues to take over, that goes away, and people can't be trusted. I know this. So when people let me down, I, I, I don't lose my footing. How about this promise, Ecclesiastes 7.2? Death is the destiny of everyone. And when I look at that word death and read it in the Bible, I always think separation. Separation from this is certain. And that teaches me don't put your roots down too tightly here because they're going to be pulled up. This is not all there is. Heaven is my home. This is not. So in this life, as I'm thinking about trouble and chaos and, and everything this coronavirus has done, three things I know. Number one, there will be trouble. Number two, people are going to let me down. And number three, uh, this is not the end of the story. Separation is the destiny of all people, myself included. That's true for me. It's true for you. And let me just share with you, when trouble comes, there's three things you can do in response to it. When trouble comes, one, you can endure it. You can pull up your bootstraps, you can tighten the belt, you can grin and bear it, and you can just say, I'm going to endure it. If I can only endure this, I'll be okay. And when you do that, you really make that trial um, your master because you will do whatever is required to endure it, and you're going to serve it in that way, and you'll have a tendency on the other end to come out hard and bitter. Second thing you can do when trouble comes is you can escape it. You can escape it. But if you escape, escape it, and there's all kinds of means by which we can do that, you'll probably miss the purposes God wants to achieve in your life if you do it. That's the downside. Escaping seems like, man, that's easy. Let me just run. Let me get out of here. But when you do, you miss God's purposes. And so the third thing, when trouble comes, you can embrace it. You can embrace it. Um, when you embrace your troubles, uh, they become your servant is what they do. They become your servant not your master, and you can have your troubles work for you. You can believe the truth of Romans 8, 28 and allow God to work all things together for your good and his glory. How this happens is faith. Faith activates promises. We could take promises in the Bible and you can give them to one who doesn't even believe in God. They'd read it. It'd mean absolutely nothing to them, but it is faith that activates promises. How? By claiming these promises and obeying the word of God. By taking them to heart and saying, that promise is written directly to me. It's written to others, sure, but it's written to me. This is God's promise from him to me. And it's in spite of what you see, how you feel, or what may happen. It's a matter of commitment to the Lord. And he will make his promises come true. Listen to this. This is in Numbers 23, 19. Because I want us to have a, an assurance in God, a assurance of God, that his promises are good and trustworthy and true. Listen to this, Numbers 23, 19. God is not human that he should lie, not a human being that he should change his mind. Does, does he speak and then not act? Does he promise and not fulfill? It's rhetorical. No, he is unlike any other. God is totally other. We have to keep that in mind with him and his guidance and direction and truth and promises that he gives us. Listen to this. The Lord is near to all who call on him, to all who call on him in truth. Psalm 145, 18. 
He is near. You don't have to set an appointment to talk to God. You don't have to get him on uh, the calendar. You don't have to wait until he's accessible or he's got time or he's not busy dealing with something else. He is near. He is always near. He is always a breath away from you. And if you feel like you have turned against him and are going the other way, if you turn around, you don't have any ground to make up because he will be right there. That's the promise of God. Some of you need to grab hold of that and say, God, I feel like I'm alone. God, I feel like you've deserted me. God, I feel like I'm isolated. And the truth, that's a lie. The truth is, God is near. He is with you. He is near. Here's another promise, Hebrews 13, 5. Never will I leave you. Never will I forsake you. He is unconditionally for you forever. He is unconditionally for me forever. Never will I leave you. It's just the confidence I have. God's not lying to me. God is telling me he's near. He never leaves me alone. He will never forsake me, never abandon me. As I was thinking about this, I came across this old poem, and I'm sure you've heard it, called Footprints in the Sand. Let me, let me read this to you. Now, you could get the words by Googling it. They're readily available. But listen to this. One night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Many scenes from my life flashed across the sky. In each scene, I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there were one set of footprints. This bothered me because I noticed that during the low periods of my life, when I suffered from anguish, sorrow, or defeat, I could only see one set of footprints. So I said to the Lord, you promised me, Lord, that if I followed you, you would walk with me always, but I have noticed that during the most trying periods of my life, there has only been one set of footprints in the sand. Why, when I needed you the most, you have not been there for me. The Lord replied, the times when you have seen only one set of footprints is when I carried you. Let me tell you the rest of the story, because uh, a lot of times, and I've, I've read this, I've quoted this, I've, I've, I've uh, had this in sermons before, and typically uh, it's been attributed to anonymous. But um, they've actually discovered the author of this uh, poem. And this was written by Mary Stevenson in 1936. Mary at the time was 14 years old. She lost her mother when she was six years old, and then um, she had many brothers and sisters. Her father did his best to provide during the Great Depression, and she went through that. And as a 14-year-old, this is what was consuming her thoughts. Amazing. <laughs> but let me just tell you about some promises. Here's some promises God has made. He says, I tell you the truth. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life and will not be condemned. He's crossed over from death to life. That promise says he's settled my future. My future is in his hands. I've trusted him with that. And if you have, you've got this same promise. You're not going to be condemned. You've crossed over from death to life. You will not be separated from God. You will be with him forever. That's a promise That's a promise that I have uh, staked my life on, and you can too. How about this one? Psalm 23, 4. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil. For you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God, that's what your presence does. It comforts me. It reminds me that you're with me. Um, it, it, It allows me not to fear any unevil or any evil or uncertainty. And that's what I need to hear at a time like this. I need to hear, I don't know what's going to happen today or tomorrow, but I know the future for me. I know I have nothing to fear because God is with me and he will comfort me, his rod and his staff. He is my shepherd and he is your shepherd if you've received him into your life. And then the last and final promise, and this, <laughs> there are so many promises in the Bible. One of the, one of the things I would encourage you to do, either in your Bible or on your app, when you come across a promise of God, pick a color and highlight it in that color so that you could take your Bible and just flip through. And every time you see that color, there's a promise, there's a promise, there's a promise. There's a ton of them, and those promises bring us hope and comfort and relief. 
But here's one, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him. And here's the promise. He will make your paths straight. It's confusing these days. What do we do? Where do we go? How do we act? What, what shall we, how, how do we respond? God says he'll make your path straight. He gives us that promise. These are promises we activate by faith. We take them to heart. We read them. We soak them in. And we claim them as ours. We're not putting words in God's mouth. What we're doing is we're receiving what he has spoken to us. And I believe that is what we could use. That's, that's the dose of encouragement we could use for today during this crisis. And I hope that's what it has accomplished. Let me pray. Father God, uh, you are the source of so many blessings. Thank you, God, that you are a promise maker. And even more importantly, you're a promise keeper. Your intentions are pure. Your communication is clear. God, you have the ability to make all these promises and keep every single one of them. And you have the resolve to make them come true in our lives. Thank you for who you are, God. Thank you with you. There's hope even in the, the dark days we live. In Jesus' name, amen.